Nikita Koloff here, the devil's worst nightmare with the Man Up podcast, where we talk to real men who have real stories, who realize it is time to man up. Your Chosen Truth Network podcast is starting in just a few seconds. Enjoy it, share it, but most of all, thank you for listening to the Truth Podcast Network. This is the Truth Network. Welcome to If Not For God, stories of hopelessness that turn to hope. Here is your host, Mike Zwick. I'm really excited today because I get to be on, if not for God, with my good friend Mike Zwick again. That's right. And Mike, God's kind of given you another night of (laughs) restlessness to give you an idea (laughs) of what to talk about. Yeah, it's funny. Every every time, uh, every night before I uh, I uh, go start the show, a lot of times what'll happen is is I'll uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll pray and I'll think and. A lot of times I can't get a good night's sleep, and I'm thinking about a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that's been on my mind is uh, overcoming obstacles. And you talk about overcoming obstacles. There was a guy named Jesus Christ, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was looking at uh, John chapter seven, uh, starting in verse one. It says, "After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way." to kill him, but when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I was thinking about that. Here you are. The Son of God, (laughs) God in human form, God in the flesh, and your own brothers don't even believe you are who you say you are. Um, And and that's one of the things that I was thinking about, Robbie, when when I was talking about overcoming obstacles. Um, Because if you you look at that, um, life is not always peaches and cream. It's not always easy. And I believe it's it's tough for Christians as well as non Christians. Um, one of the one of the stories that we were looking at and talking about was J C Penney, James Cash Penney. Uh, you guys remember the founder of J C Penney Stores. Um, he grew up and uh, in the late eighteen hundreds, and uh, I think it was eighteen seventy five. And by the time he was twenty six years old in nineteen o two, he be, he had become such a hard worker. Um, that the people that he he worked for was in business with they they made him a, a partial owner of the company, and uh, later on he actually moved to I believe Wyoming, um, to where he started the J C Penney Company, um, and throughout the I guess the 1910s and the 1920s he was wildly successful, um, and then the Great Depression hit, and things actually got so tough for him, that what happened was was he. He couldn't even pay his bill, so he actually had to borrow from his life insurance policies just to make the payroll. And so... Yeah, and you not, can only do that one time and you're done. <laughs> yeah, you can only do that one time and you're done. And and he ended up going to... Um, it was the Kellogg, if you remember the, the Kellogg, the cereal place, but they had an institution. And it didn't go into too much detail, but I kind of get the feeling it might have been a nervous breakdown. Right. <laughs> um, and while he was there... He, he got the treatment, but he actually heard a woman singing a, a hymn, a beautiful hymn, and he became a born-again Christian. Well, fast forward after that, he got out, of the, uh, got out of the hospital, and the business was wildly successful. And so he became successful in business, and he was also a born-again Christian. So now, as far as we know, he's in heaven. Um, and, and one of the things that I, that I think of is that, you know, had... God just allowed him to have uninterrupted success. Well, he might have made a lot of money. He might have been really not might have done really well. Um, but there was something much better in it for him, um, and it was salvation. Um, and and Robbie, you had actually had a story about a, a young man drowning in a lake. Yeah, it's one of my favorite. I actually use it in my prayer life every day because it's such a wonderful story. Um, and I'll explain how I use that in my prayer life after I tell you the story. So a missionary family, you know, has a furlough to come back to the United States and rest and raise support for their mission. And, and a 
you know, very kind family says, hey, we got this lake house. Come on up and, you know, just make the place. You just make yourself at home. Feel free to use a boat. I had a little, you know, rowboat out on a little dock that went out there and a boathouse out there that was really cool. So, the, mm. you know, that first day they obviously they had two little girls and a little boy. And the little boy was three and little girls were a little bit older. So they were supposed to watch their brother. Mm. And they were out playing. And the father was, you know, just – hanging out in the boathouse, checking out all the nets or whatever was in there. And all of a sudden, the little girls lose sight of the brother. And the brother wanders down to the dock, sees the boat, thinks that might be fun, doesn't step into it right, and goes off into the water. Mm. At what point the girls scream. The father comes running out of the boathouse, and he, you know, dives into the water trying to find the boy, you know, He's reaching out with all his might, try to find him, but you know how lake water is. It's cloudy. He can only see two or three feet in front of him. He's reaching out with his arms, legs. Where is he? Where can he be? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He runs out of air, comes up, takes a deep breath. I've got to find him. I don't know. You know, you know, you don't have any time. You couldn't be more frantic. And he's reaching out with all his feelings. He's even obviously praying, God, you know, help me find my son. Right. Everything he can possibly do to find him comes up for air the second time and says, oh, there's no way he could hold his breath this long. You know, this is but I got to find him. I just got to find him. So he takes another gulp of air, goes down, reaches out with all he's got, and finally Hmm. feels the little boy. But he quickly discovers that the little boy has a death grip Hmm. on the pier that is holding the dock up, right? The pier that's Mm -hmm. down in the mud. And the little boy will not turn loose of it. And so, you know, fortunately the dad was stronger, and he finally pries the boy off, you know, gets him up, you know, resuscitates him. The the little boy was okay. Hmm. You know, after about an hour, when everybody was back to a little bit normal after this horrific accident, the um, father asked his son, you know, son, I I just don't understand. Why did you have that death grip on that pillar, you know, on that pier? Why would you not turn loose of it when I had you? And he said, right, because I knew you'd come. Right. And, And the point is, the boy had held on to emotionally the only thing that he could with all that he had was the thought that his father was going to come save him. Yeah. And, and so I didn't tell you this part of the story, but every morning is just my ritual, I guess, I go through in prayer, mm-hmm. is, is I get to this point where I ask the Holy Spirit to lead me in prayer. Yeah. You know, and I actually say, you know, in that groaning thing you do, well, I need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I say, you know, you know, you guys, and I'm talking to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I put the death hug grip on them, and I go, yeah. you know, you guys are really all I have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, That's it. And and that actually anchors me in, in my prayer in the morning. Um, ever since I heard that story, I've used it. Um is is just an agger point for me to go. Well, at the end of the day, really, all I really do have is, is that, and I know they'll come. Mm. I know they'll come. Yeah. The um, that's good. The uh, I was actually, you know, we had talked about Daniel chapter three before, uh, but when you were talking about going through that tough time, because that must have been a horrible time for the father and the son, but also, I mean, a horrible time for the father because oh I've gosh. got a three year old and I mean, I and and. One of them was at the pool a couple weeks ago, and they actually f- sort of fell in for like a second, and we got it was fine, but it was yeah. awful. I mean, it was it, it was awful. But one of the things that I was thinking of is, is Daniel chapter three, and we'll start in verse one. It says, "King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, sixty cubits high and six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and everyone else." to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Basically what he did was he set up this image, and he said, everybody's got to bow down. Um, And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down. And so the king actually brings him up, and and he says, uh, hey, you know, just wanted to let you know, you're supposed to bow down. (laughs) Hey, if if I'm going to do this thing again, and you can bow down, and then everything will be all right. But if you don't bow down, I'm going to kill you. Not just kill him. They're just going to cook him. He's going to cook him in the fire. Yeah. And, uh, and, they, and they knew that. And, and, and what they said, and they said it boldly, um, was that they said, 
the, our God can save us from this fire. He can basically keep us from getting burned up. He can save our lives. But they said, even if he, do, even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. And so we read the story now, and we know what the ending is. <laughs> right. But at that point in the story, they didn't know how it was going to end. They really didn't, Robbie. And, you know, I, I, I think. And neither did the little boy. Neither did the little boy. Neither did the father in, 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 in the story that you're talking about. And so maybe in America, for, for as long as we've, we've known it, things have been pretty easy. I mean, we've been able to cling on, and we were talking about this before, we've, we've been able to cling on to a lot of other things. You know, if, if, we, uh, if we need something to eat, we go to the grocery store. If we need some money, we go work for it. Um, if we need some medicine, if we get hurt, we go to the doctor and they fix it. Um, you know, I guess, what if all that stuff was taken away from you? Um, what would you have? And, and one of the things when you were talking about the little boy clinging on to the wood, I mean, we as Christians, we, we cling on to Jesus, right? I hope so. And, you know, we all have our stories, but when you talked about this topic, you know, in Romans 5, it talks us how, you know, <laughs> everybody's going to have tribulation, and that tribulation right. is going to produce patience, and patience, right. endurance. Endurance, you know, leads eventually to faith. So, you right. know, I bought the Chrysler dealership with help from investors and all that right. we did back in in the year 1998. And right. so I had this brand new business, not unlike J.C. Penney. And I, like J.C. Penney, borrowed money on my life insurance and everything else in the world I could right. to get this business off the ground right. to fund it. And it took off. And it was doing pretty good. And all looked good. But the challenge was that because there were so few employees, it was a small dealership in Moxville, North Carolina, I was the major sales force of the of the establishment. So, um, you know, I had a couple other people that sold cars, but I sold the majority of cars. And so, you know, you, you can't lose your best salesman <laughs> and the owner and all the stuff going on, or so you think. If you're Robbie Dilmore, this is can't be good. Well, right. that happened to be the time that that God allowed me to get a brain am, um, abscess, which I don't know if you know what that is, but. What happened was I started getting these horrible headaches. They thought, wow, your lymphoma is going to come back, so we need to do what they call a brain biopsy. And so that means that they're literally going to cut a hole in your head, which I have a really neat hole in my head my kids love to stick their finger in. Um, they did when they were little. They don't okay. anymore. Okay. And to see what's going on in there, to see if the lymphoma was in there. Okay. But when they put the, a little titanium plate in there to hold that together, um, it had a staph infection on it, and that staph infection quickly grew, uh. and that became an abscess, a and it honestly may be the closest I ever really did come to dying, because mm. it grew in my brain, and I can remember the girl at the hospital. I'd been in the hospital for mm -hmm. about six weeks, and she was like, Mr. Dilmore, I'm going to hang this bag. This is your last chance right here. If this doesn't work, you know, we need to figure out some funeral arrangements, you know, because it's really spreading through your brain. This is not good news, okay? <laughs> this is so this what, is real what, life tribulation. What, what was going through your mind? Yeah, I, I loved. I, I actually, God's used that helped me several times. Um, what was going through my mind was the twenty third Psalm. That, hmm. um, and, and specifically, there's a, a book called The Shepherd's Guide to the Twenty Third Psalm, where he talked about. How surely and and you may even heard the old joke surely and good surely goodness will follow you all the days of your life yeah. you know, but surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, and, and you will live in the house of the Lord forever. Right. Well, apparently, if you, according to this shepherd's guide, the um, guard the guide to the twenty third psalm, if you shepherd your sheep correctly they they turn what would be worthless pasture into what you know they call like the, the animal with the golden feet because they can turn worthless pasture into this unbelievable field that that can host lots of different kind of animals mm -hmm. and so in the song of solomon when 
it's it's really cool. In the first chapter, it says where the the beloved is trying to find her lover, and and she goes to the the people in the field. They said, "Well, follow the tracks of the sheep." Well, what they're saying is that the tracks of the sheep is going to be a really green path. Okay, and that your life to your life, my life is a, if we're believers. We leave like green pastures behind us. And, mm-hmm. and so when you say surely goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life, that, that's this picture of this green grass that's growing as a result of your struggles and the things you went and through your life to, to help other people to feed on Jesus. Are yeah. you getting the picture? It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just focused on that because I knew that, and, and it was really a cool experience in its own way in spite of the fact mm-hmm. that I— but now think about this. I was in the hospital for three months. Mm-hmm. Brand new business. We went from selling <laughs> 35, 40 cars a month <laughs> okay. to selling seven or eight, 10, 12 cars a month oh, for wow. those months that I was in the hospital. Okay. So now not I'm leaving the hospital, but everything I have, including my life, is going to crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think. Right. Right? So I think. Right? A- and. Um, about, but I got better and the vancomycin work that they put me on and eventually I got out and, and, and eventually was back to where I could operate. A year later when I reviewed the whole thing, you know, financially, what had happened, mm-hmm. had I can, I did not know that I was running the dealership into a catastrophe because the way that car dealerships work is it takes a ton of money to sell a lot of cars because every time you trade for a car, you got to pay off that person's loan and, and you got to bring this other car into inventory and the, you got this huge float that's going on and it'd be a little hard to explain unless you're a car dealer, but I just tell you right. that if you're building momentum in sales, you're gobbling up your working capital by the gobs. Mm. And I could show you on paper, had I been allowed to continue to sell cars at the rate I thought I needed to, mm-hmm. to make money, because every car salesman thinks, how do you make money? You sell cars. Right, right. But if I'd done that, I'd run the dealership into the ditch. Okay. If I had not gone into the hospital, <laughs> I'm telling you, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is something I could, I could sit back and look at how God bailed me. I mean, yeah, I... I'm not saying he brought on that infection in any way, shape, or form, but I know he allowed it, and to an extent, from for that season of my life, if, if it had not been for that illness, Westside would never have made it the years that it did. Yeah, if it's not, wild. If not for God, <laughs> <laughs> we ought to name a show. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, um, you know, and one of the things that we were talking about too is is that how God can sometimes use adversity to help you. In, in the long run, and it sounded, no, I know you wouldn't have wanted to go through all that again or whatever, but it ended up helping you in your business. And it, in Romans eight twenty eight, it says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and for them who are called according to his purpose. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about is I remember my senior year of high school. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told you about this, but I, <laughs> I was in class and uh, I was never really good in science. And uh, so I said, well, I've I've got the answers on this sheet. <laughs> I'll just put it underneath the uh, underneath the paper, and I'll I'll look at the uh, the answers, and and I'll pass the test, and everything will be fine. Well, I guess that teacher had been around the block a time or two. <laughs> she was walking around. She pulled the sheet up, and I went to the uh, went to the the principal's office, and. Uh, it, it was embarrassing. I mean, people knew about it. It was awful. But w- what I didn't know was that the first time at that time, and it might have changed, but the first time that you get caught cheating, it doesn't get reported on anything. It, it didn't get reported to any colleges or anything like that. No, the second time you would. Uh, but so all of that happened. It was horrible. But I, I looked back on it and I said, me getting, me getting caught cheating on that test could have prevented maybe other bad things down the road from happening because it was really a lesson learned. Um, you know, even later on in life, I mean, what if, you know, it could have been a lot bigger things that I would have cheated on. It could have been a lot of, you know, could have gotten sent to prison for something. I mean, we've seen this happen with with businessmen who make a lot of money and then they're doing stuff under the table and then bam, they get, you know, Bernie Madoffs or whoever it is. So, um, I learned my lesson. Um, there was also another guy I went to college with, um, he also got caught cheating on a test and, uh, 
uh, heard this later on in the next school year, but they said over the summer um, he had kind of put all of his marbles into doing really well in school. And over the course of that summer, um, he actually killed himself. Um, and so I don't think it's really a matter of when the obstacles or if the obstacles are coming, it's just when. And I think that we have to prepare ourselves, but I knew that guy, and he wasn't a Christian. He didn't have hope. So he thought, well, if I'm not going to be successful in school, then really what's the point of it all? But um, I think that's 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 the whole purpose of us doing this show, is to really get to help give some people some hope, right? Yeah, and I, that's the thing I love about the Bible is that it's so transparent about you know the people's flaws and them getting caught cheating on tests <laughs> you know you know Jacob with the hairy arms and you yeah. know you, you you almost take your character take your pick right and, and you're going to see that there were situations that God allowed them you know this ultimate risk of giving us free will um and then when he came to their rescue, whatever that looked like, it, it, came, it came with a message. And as I hear your story, you know, I can't help but note that when that friend of yours got caught cheating on the test and then led to that, it, it was a stronger message for you based on your own experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when, I was, um, when I was, I think, 14 years old, I took a whole bottle of pills and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I didn't die. I think I took 18 pills. I, in this, I'm going off of memory. I think I took 18 of the pills, and then my dad told me about a year later. He said he saw a kid on it was on one of these shows, uh, CBS or something like that, and he said the kid died from taking 12 of the same pills that I t- had taken. Um, and the 18 pills that I took were twice as strong. Um, so it was really like taking 36 versus 12. And so, I mean, you know, when we talk about that, it's, it's all grace, right? I mean, it, you know, if not for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, I did exactly the same thing when I was 15. I, I took a bottle of, of Somonix. Like, what are you thinking? And I don't know, you know, it, it, <laughs> but I couldn't even sleep all night. I was so scared I was going to die. <laughs> 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 yeah, That was... It, it was a horrible thing, but I realized later in life, as God pointed out in my own family, I went through similar struggles. Right. Um, and I realized, had I succeeded in what I was thought I was doing, I would have not only murdered me, I would have murdered my three kids. It would never, have, never had a chance. You know that. Right. You know, and it's fascinating to me that God pulls me out of all these different scenarios essentially like what it says in Romans and it also says in James you know don't consider it strange that you you know come into you know various trials of different kind because mm-hmm. you know God is initiating us as sons mm-hmm. and 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 st- strength of character strength of morals there's a really cool um, thing that I discovered of the of the place of the prodigal son that the Jews actually have taught that way before Jesus told the story. Mm. A- and they call it a Baal Teshuva, but it, it means someone that has really gone astray and then, you know, come the right way. And they, you know, the Jews themselves teach that the Baal Teshuva, the, the prodigal who turns back towards life, mm. who returns back home, essentially with a burning desire to go home to the kingdom, Mm-hmm. has a higher seat at the table than the righteous brother. Mm-hmm. Now, think about what Jesus taught with the prodigal son, right? He had the brother that had, right, was essentially the righteous one, mm-hmm. a- and he resented the brother that had, that had sinned and turned back. Mm-hmm. But what they teach is absolutely beautiful. They say that somebody who has em- embraced their, their side and fallen away like you did with your test, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm that you now have overcome that temptation in a way you know the results of that and you know that to an extent 
you know, how God came through for you, and so you're a whole lot less likely to cheat on the next test. Well, it's the same thing with all sorts of sin, mm-hmm. right? That right. once we return, according to what they teach, and I believe this wholeheartedly, mm-hmm. that you return in a better place with God because he now, you have a relationship where you can, you can count on him in a different way than you could before, mm. because you know, even though you're a mess up, and even though you made all these choices that led to all sorts of disasters, mm. he's still there for you. That person that's never done anything that they needed Jesus for, they mm. don't know. They mm. don't. They haven't been to jail yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like but Ted or Todd, you know, talked about in the show we did a few weeks ago. Well, and and before we go, I wanted to look at something. It says there's an upsurge in depression and suicide among American workers during the pandemic and what needs to be done. Um, It was interesting that we brought up the suicide because I actually heard a sermon on the way over here about suicide and a lady who had tried to commit suicide and, and, or she was about to, and she, her grandmother forced her to go to church. (laughs) And the people in there literally started prophesying over this girl. And she said, okay. And before she left, there was a man, and he said, can I pray for you? And she said when the man prayed for her, she decided not to commit suicide. But, you know, unfortunately, the the suicide rate in America is going up, and it's been going up for the past two decades. Um, But the good news is is that you don't have to kill yourself. And and the good news is is that there is hope. Jesus is that hope. And if, if you've never given your life to Jesus, would you pray with Robbie right now? I know personally how much you are the answer that I can hold on to you like that little boy and you will come yes I I know that you came on the cross that you willingly gave your own life that I would live be able to live with you as the son of God for eternity Lord I I know personally through so many different things how much you have come for me and I pray everybody listening to it to to Mike and I that haven't had that experience would embrace it ask you to come into their life ask you to forgive them and cover them in the, in, the, in the blood that you gave that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty for our sin and that, that you truly would rescue us and, 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 and we would have this relationship with you where we could live with you and bring people into our life, Lord, that would teach us more about you and send us deeper into your love. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If not for God. If not for God. <laughs> This is the Truth Network.